what an incredible experience. Oh my God, that's good. What do you get when you take a city that was at one time one of the most powerful in Europe, the seat of an empire that stretched the known world and thrust it into the modern era? You get a city like Lisbon, a fascinating fusion of hip and heritage, a place ever marching forward but never losing respect for its past, a city whose culture is steeped in the sea and embodied by a spirit of exploration and passionate curiosity. Now we're here in Lisbon to explore everything that this amazing city has to offer, but in true nomadic bard fashion, we don't have a lot of time to do it. So come on, let's get going. Draped over the picturesque hills of Portugal's central coast, Lisbon is a city with soul. It's all at once charming and cosmopolitan, a unique blend of modern sensibility and deep historical relevance. First settled over 3,000 years ago, it's one of the oldest cities in Europe. Lisbon has stood as the capital of Portugal since the 13th century, serving as both the cultural and historical epicenter of one of the world's great maritime empires. Beginning in the 1400s, Portugal was a key player in Europe's age of discovery. Portuguese explorers like Vasco da Gama were instrumental in establishing trading colonies in Africa and Asia. Thanks to the wealth and power granted by the spice routes, Portugal became a de facto world superpower. And while this period of prosperity eventually waned, its influence is still felt in Lisbon to this day. Now, Portugal's history as a seafaring nation has deeply influenced its culture, both in the past and today. Sailing is still a huge deal. You hear it in the music, you taste it in the food, you see it in the architecture. The connection to the ocean for both young and old in Portugal, it's a big deal. Much like the sea, it's hard to fully appreciate Lisbon without understanding its importance in Portuguese history. And there's no better way to learn about this city's past than by visiting one of its most important attractions, the Castelo de São Jorge. So this is the entrance to Castelo de São Jorge, the Castle of St. George, which is one of the most prominent tourist attractions in Lisbon. It's a great place to start your trip because it overlooks the rest of the city. You can get absolutely spectacular views out over the Tagus River and towards the Atlantic. And it's also kind of the seat of a lot of the history of Lisbon. Beginning in the first century BC, Lisbon has been ruled by the Celts, the Phoenicians, the Carthaginians, Romans, Visigoths, the Moorish, and of course the Portuguese, all from this spot. The castle has fallen prey to two major earthquakes over the last 600 years, meaning that many of the structures that stand today have been rebuilt. Despite this fact, strolling the grounds and learning from the exhibits gives you a fascinating insight into Lisbon's importance as a cultural and economic hub over the last 2,000 years. But a word of advice, if you're coming to the castle, buy your tickets online. I'm eternally amazed that people don't know about this. You can buy it online, it's the same price. You breeze right past the gigantic hour-long line to buy tickets here, and you go straight into the castle. So do your research and buy your tickets ahead of time. It's so easy. Now, once you've had your fill of history, it's time to start exploring Lisbon itself. And the Castelo's central location means that fantastic wandering can be had just a few steps beyond the castle walls. So just beneath and sort of around the Castelo sits this neighborhood, which is called Alfama. And it's one of the oldest neighborhoods in Lisbon. Traditionally, it was more of a working class area as it was built outside of the city walls. So historically, it didn't have the protections from being inside the castle. But today, it's a gorgeous and quaint place, perfect for just getting lost and wandering through the narrow alleyways. All the buildings have this gorgeous weathered patina to them that really gives the area a ton of characters and make it a perfect destination for just strolling and relaxing. The Alfama area is the perfect place to get a real feel for Lisbon. Its meandering stairways, cozy corners, and tile-clad architecture paint a poetic picture of the city's past and present. The buildings here are famous for their tilework facades. Intricate, hand-painted squares of azure blue adorn many of the city's walls, giving each one an artisan quality that defines Lisbon's visual landscape. Heading north from Alfama takes you into Moraria, the Moorish Quarter. My favorite discovery here was O Tributo, a public art exhibition by photographer Camilla Watson. Antique photographs of Moraria's beloved elders are immortalized on wood panels, lending a captivating view into a timeless community. After wandering this enchanting corner of Lisbon, we found ourselves a bit hungry. 
and there's no better opportunity to connect with a culture than a great local meal. So now Portuguese cuisine is really, really fascinating because it has a lot in common with its neighbor Spain, but some key differences. Much like Spanish cuisine, there is a huge focus on extremely fresh, extremely vibrant local ingredients. But in contrast to Spanish cuisine, the focus, especially in coastal regions like here in Lisbon, is seafood. And so we're here at O Corvo to try out some of the dishes. First thing, polvo, or octopus. Now, a lot of American palates would be challenged by octopus because it's kind of an unusual ingredient unless you're really used to seafood. But here in Portugal, much like in Spain, it is a very, very typical ingredient and when done right, it is absolutely delicious. It's sweet, it's tender, and has this beautiful texture. I almost think of it like a ham or turkey. When you cook it correctly, it really is just that smooth. So now on to the main event of our meal. This is bacalao, or dried and salted cod filet over a bed of fried potatoes. Now, Portugal's affair with cod started so long ago that it was before they had any kind of refrigeration. So they figured out this drying, salting and drying technique to help preserve it for use on long ship voyages. And it gives the cod a really unique flavor and really, really unique texture. And normally cod, it's not flavorless, but it's a very, very mild fish. But with this, this kind of bacalao style, um, it's really rich. It really brings out the buttery, uh, really savory umami notes in the fish, but it also brings out this really beautiful, gentle sweetness. Absolutely spectacular. You know, it's funny, I really didn't know that much about Portuguese cuisine until we came here, so I've kind of been discovering it as we've been trying these different restaurants. But it's really, really neat. It really is an insight into how modern Portugal looks at their culture, because it has, the whole country has this very historical connection to the ocean, and you see that reflected in the food. Even though there's tons of great fresh local ingredients and spices and all these amazing flavors, it's all there for one reason, and that's to support the seafood as the main star of every single dish. It's very, very cool. Once our tummies were stuffed with the many fruits of the Atlantic, we headed straight into Lisbon's beating heart, the downtown district of Baixa. Lisbon's central core presents a very different vibe to that of the quiet alleys of Alfama. This is where the city puts on the cosmopolitan face of a modern European capital. Most of the action is centered around Rua Augusta, a pedestrian avenue that runs through the heart of downtown. This is the center of the tourist trail in Lisbon, and while there's certainly plenty to see and do here, the surrounding area offers a bit more authenticity. At the north end sits the Praça Dom Pedro IV, which is headed by Lisbon's National Theater and features gigantic and ornate Baroque fountains. And just around the corner hides a tiny but legendary hole-in-the-wall spot offering a uniquely Lisboan experience. Now, just as Portuguese cuisine is incredibly important to the Portuguese people, there's also a strong culture here of liquors, alcohols, loses of all shapes and sizes. And this is arguably the most famous. This is called Ginginha. And we are here at a Ginginha, one of the most famous purveyors of this very unique spirit. And what they do is they start with a brandy, then they soak cherries in it until they sort of start fermenting, and then they add sugar and cinnamon. And apparently, it's absolutely incredible. I have not tried it yet, so let's check it out. That's delicious. Uh, it's incredibly nuanced. There's a lot going on. The cinnamon, you can taste the sweetness, you can taste the sourness of the cherries. Man, talk about delicious. Making your way back down the Rua Augusta, you pass another of Lisbon's famous landmarks, the Elevador de Santa Justa. Built in 1902, this ornate public elevator links Baixa to the upper neighborhood of Barrio Alto. And reaching the southern end of the boulevard, you pass through the massive triumphal arch and into one of Lisbon's most iconic sites, the Praça do Comercio. Facing the banks of the Tagus River, this jaw-dropping plaza was designed as an unforgettable entrance to the city beyond it. Visiting dignitaries and nobles would be met here with a truly staggering display of Portugal's wealth. It was originally the site of the King's Royal Palace, but after a devastating earthquake in 1755, it was reimagined as the grand courtyard it is today. Now, obviously, the area around the plaza and the main walking street is the most touristy part of Lisbon. Kind of goes without saying. But does that mean you should avoid it, like the plague? No, not at all. It's definitely a cool area to wander around in moderation. Now, of course, 
all the things that happen in extremely touristy places happen here. There's touts everywhere, guides trying to get you to come take their tours. There are throngs of crowds packed shoulder to shoulder, tourist trap restaurants charging way too much for dishes that aren't nearly as good as they claim they are. So just be aware, keep your normal traveler wits about you and you will be fine. However, I will say if you wanna see the really authentic and more sort of heritage oriented side of Lisbon, this isn't necessarily the place to come. Obviously, it goes without saying that Central Lisbon has a ton to offer for the savvy traveler, but we weren't done quite yet. As night fell over the Tagus, we ventured back out for another truly unique Portuguese experience. So obviously there's a ton to see in Lisbon as you wander to the many corners of the city, but what is there to do? Well, I found myself in a quiet corner of the Alfama neighborhood after dark, and we're here for dinner and a show. But it's not just any show. We're here to check out Fado, the national music of Portugal. It could be said that Fado is the musical embodiment of Portuguese identity. In stark contrast to the explosive rhythms of its neighbor flamenco, Fado is slow haunting and beautiful. Its mournful lyrics are set to the twinkling of a Portuguese guitar. At the core of Fado music is saudade, a powerful emotion of nostalgic longing, of reveling in the absence of a cherished memory. Many traditional songs speak of love lost to the sea. A husband, father, or brother who left Portugal's shores in search of opportunity fated never to return. This feeling of saudade is linked not only to Fado music, but to the soul of Portugal itself. Just as one laments a lost love, so too does the nation yearn for its years of glory. We absorbed this profound experience at O Carido, a photo house and restaurant that prides itself on keeping this unique musical tradition alive. They also serve up an incredible menu, baked local cheese with a raspberry coulis, morcella or Portuguese blood sausage, and duck leg confit with orange glaze served over sweet potatoes and cabbage. Our meal was accompanied by several delicious pours of vintage port. It was a night I'll never forget, and it showed me just how deep the traditions of this small nation truly go. Man, what an incredible experience. You know, I really believe that there's no better way to get to know a culture than through its music. And Fado is unlike any other musical tradition I've heard among the different European styles. It's totally different than flamenco or classical. It's got its own thing going on and it's absolutely beautiful. And this idea of saudade, this longing, this sort of nostalgic absence, it's a huge part of the Portuguese identity from what I'm told. And it's fascinating and I feel like I kind of understand it now which is really cool. I mean, this is why we travel, to understand other cultures and to have new experiences. Absolutely awesome. The next morning, we set out beyond the central core of Lisbon in search of something a bit different. Our destination, the neighborhood of Belém. You know, Belém is the perfect place to escape to if you're feeling just a little bit overwhelmed by the energy and noise of the city center in Lisbon. It's a lot quieter, it's a lot more spread out. There's still quite a few tourists here because it is the location of so many of Lisbon's historic attractions, but it's just an awesome place to escape the hustle and bustle if you're finding it a little overwhelming. Located a few miles west of downtown, Belém is known for its grand parks, quaint neighborhoods, and historical museums and monuments. There's plenty to see here, and it makes for a perfect morning of exploration. The striking Belém Tower, built in the early 16th century, served as a primary point of embarkation for many of Portugal's explorers. A short walk up the shore takes you to the much more modern Pedrao dos Descobrimentos. Created in 1939, this grand monument pays homage to Portugal during the Age of Discovery. Depictions of monarchs, explorers, and cartographers stand along the prow of a great stone caravel with Henry the Navigator at the helm. 
Heading north across the Avenida de India takes you to the Jeronimos Monastery, a spectacular 16th century complex that served as the final resting place for Portugal's royalty. Its monks prayed for the safety of the explorers who set out into unknown seas, and its intricate towers were a welcome sight to those returning home from their journey. But the monks of Hieronymus weren't known only for their spiritual prowess. I'm told that they were also incredible bakers of all things, and their delicious recipes live on to this day, thanks to the legendary Pastéche de Belém. Now, pastries and sweet making in general are a huge part of Portuguese food culture, and you can buy incredible pastries and sweets all over Lisbon and indeed the rest of the country. But this is the best of the best. Apparently, this is one of the 50 best things to eat in the world. These are known as pastel de nada, and I'm told they're absolutely incredible. What they are are these beautiful little egg custard tarts. They smell amazing. The pastry is practically dissolving in my hand, which is always a good sign. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's one of the 50 best things in the world. I totally believe it. It's sweet, it's creamy, it's warm. We just bought them, so they're fresh out of the oven. The pastry is impossibly flaky. You saw it just dissolve out of my mouth. Oh my God, that's good. As incredible as they are, these squat little pastries aren't the only delicious things on offer around Belém. Gunning for a late lunch, we headed a short ways back towards central Lisbon to a very different kind of local attraction. So this is LX Factory, probably one of the hippest places in Lisbon. Sort of a disused set of warehouses and old industrial buildings that have been converted into this incredible walking street of restaurants and art spaces. Now, we are hungry for a late lunch, so let's go find something to eat. So we decided to step into 1300 Taberna for our late lunch. I'm really excited because looking at their menu, they have a lot of classic Portuguese ingredients and techniques, but it's also blended with a lot of world influences, very kind of modern infusion. Very, very cool. Got so much great stuff here to try. The first thing I'm gonna dig into, we have an abanico of black pork served on brioche with homemade pickles and a balfana sauce, I believe they called it. Oh, that is awesome. That's awesome. It's like the best barbecue sandwich you've ever heard. The pork is insanely tender. The sauce, I've got a, a Google later because I'm not entirely sure what all is going on in this dish. It's a technique I've ever, never heard of and a sauce I've never heard of, but it's just incredible. Mm. These are duck croquetas uh, in, a, in a orange mustard, I believe. And croquetas, you know, obviously we see them in Spanish cuisine, but they are also in Portuguese cuisine. Perfect little fried spheres full of creamy, delicious goodness with a beautiful strip of duck there on the top, that orange mustard sauce on the bottom. Mmm. Oh, this has got to be one of my absolute favorite dishes on the planet. I mean, who can go wrong with taking a bunch of delicious meat and veggies and seasonings, putting them in a great sauce, and then magically encapsulating it in batter and deep frying it? It's just heaven. After an amazing meal at 1300 Taberna and an impromptu rock show happening just outside, we made our way back into the heart of the city. And as the sun set, we stepped out one last time to wander its endlessly rewarding streets. Barrio Alto, Lisbon's thriving nightlife district. It's an awesome place to come out, have a drink, have a great meal, and have a great time. Obviously, you can practically cut the energy with a knife. There's street performers around every corner, amazing public art, great shops, great dining. If you're looking to have a fun night out, this is the place to be. But we're here because we're a little peckish. And while we love Portuguese cuisine, and we've had a ton of it over the last couple of days, bacalao is definitely something I wasn't expecting to love quite as much as I do, we're in the mood for something a little bit different. If you've come to Lisbon looking to see and be seen, Barrio Alto is the place to go. After dark, it's a party in every direction. And while the neighborhood has more than a few options on offer when it comes to dining, we decided to change things up. 
Beyond its own, Lisbon is home to cultures the world over, thanks in large part to Portugal's relationship with its former colonies. We stepped into Sanskar Nepal, one of the city's best rated restaurants, to enjoy some classic dishes from the Indian subcontinent. While it was a bit too cramped and loud to film a full tasting, the meal was fantastic. Garlic naan, vegetable pakora, chicken makhni, matar paneer, all were excellent examples of the flavors of the spice trade. To me, this meal served as a final stitch in the fascinating fabric of Lisbon. While this city may represent the essence of Portugal, all cultures are respected and appreciated here with equal measure. It's just another facet that makes this incredible city what it is. As our time in Lisbon drops to a close, I've been thinking a lot about this concept of saudade, this longing, this nostalgia. And from what I understand, it's not just expressed in Fado music, it's almost become a part of the national identity of the Portuguese. And that makes a lot of sense. Portugal was a massive superpower, kind of ruled the seas for hundreds and hundreds of years. And I think there's a longing, a saudade, for that period of time, for Portugal's golden age. But as much as we look to the past, look at what Lisbon is today. It's tolerant, it's diverse, it's gorgeous. It's an extraordinary fusion of past, present, and future. You know, we noticed something really interesting as we were wandering around the city. There's all these gorgeous blue tiled buildings and the graffiti artists of the city who do tags and street art and all this stuff, they never, ever, ever tag the tile. They're always aware of it and they paint around it, right next to it, but never on it. And that to me, really represents the soul of Lisbon. It's an honoring of its heritage, it's respect for the past while constantly moving forward into the future. Obviously, it's an extraordinary city with a ton to offer and we barely scratched the surface. At the end of the day, all I know is that I can't wait to come back. and thrust it, thrust, but, right, okay. But it's also, but there's a ton to see in Portugal, one in Portugal in Lisbon. A longing this, ah, pop. Cool. Pop. <laughs> Something in there was usable. <laughs>